On October 3rd, KLRU presents American Graduate Day, a seven-hour live broadcast to celebrate how communities are helping students stay in school and on the path to graduation. We hope you'll join us for that. Uh, right now, we're going to be tuning in on uh, organic gardening and focusing in with Forrest Arnold from the Austin Organic Gardening Club, one of the, in, in fact, the oldest continually operating garden club in the United States. Yes, recognized by the Rodale Institute. So, well, congratulations on that, celebrating your 70th anniversary this year. That's yes. big news. Founded in 1945. It's pretty amazing. It uh, ahead of the curve on many ways, this town. <laughs> Indeed. Well, you know, speaking of trends, organic gardening seems to have just been booming for decades now. What's, what's hot right now in terms of organic gardening? Well, I would say that uh, it's booming now because so many people are seeing how well it works. So mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been proved how well it works and people are picking up on that. Um, yeah. In the last decade or so, I would think that some of the, the big trends are that it's, it's no longer a fringe element. It really is mainstream when you can buy pr uh, organic produce at just about any store and uh, your big box stores carry uh, organic and least toxic uh, mm -hmm. methods along with their other methods, but, sure. uh, but, but it's there. And uh, one other uh, uh, bright star in here in Austin is that the Zilker Botanical Gardens, uh, their landscapes are maintained organically now. Well, that's good news, and it, it, it speaks to, the, again, how well it works. It, you know, you wouldn't do it if it didn't work. Right. And uh, that's what I think when I think of organic gardening. It actually has simplified gardening for me in a lot of ways, I think. Um, and, and made it more effective. And what is it, you know, a lot of people are confused by the term organic gardening. What, do you, what does it mean to you, Forrest? Well, what it means is working with the natural sy biological systems that are out there, uh, optimizing inputs uh, for it, um, and uh, minimizing any harm you might do to knock it out of balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, because these are these are natural systems that God made, and uh, they work very well uh, and mostly undisturbed. Yeah, well, you know, just natural, gentle interventions, really. That's true. Uh, mm -hmm. And when when there are pest outbreaks, there are generally uh, least toxic methods that can be used to bring those insects under control without damaging your population of beneficial insects. Well, whether the pests are insects or squirrels or birds, a big question a lot of people have is how to, you know, they, they work hard, they grow these beautiful tomato plants, they're about to harvest their tomatoes or their peach trees, they have a beautiful crop coming in, they go out to pick them and <laughs> they see that the birds have eaten half of them or squirrels the other half. What, and there's some good preventative measures here that organic gardeners use, right? Yes, I do have uh, fruit trees that I put the uh, bird netting over all the way to the ground so for against the birds and the uh, squirrels. But uh, the other part of the uh, preventing the squirrels is that my puppy dog runs out there and, and chases them <laughs> off before yeah. they have a chance to uh, break through the uh, bird netting. Right. Well, securing the netting is an important tip. I mean, a lot of people just put it out and kind of drape it over the tree, but birds can fly in underneath, and certainly the squirrels can crawl in underneath. Indeed. So you got to, you really got to secure it. But uh, that, that will reduce the frustration level a lot if you use those. <laughs> that's true, and that's a fairly easy <clears throat> one. Uh, if you want to get more complicated, you could put an electric wire around the fence that's uh, <laughs> under <laughs> the tree. But um, uh, so there have been other uh, ways people have done that. But uh, also on your tomatoes, uh, I hear it works very well to put some red Christmas ornaments mm -hmm. out there uh, before the, your real tomatoes uh, turn right. red, uh, such that uh, the birds get dis disappointed and go elsewhere. Right. I've used little foam balls that I spray painted red or little wooden balls that I got at craft shops and use, and it, it, it works pretty well. Uh, good. Eventually they figure yeah. it out, though. <laughs> oh, true. Well, you share just a little, but you still have a big harvest yourself. Right. Well, you you you, you fool them for a while. <laughs> okay. Yes. But, but you know, you know, a lot of when it comes down to organics, uh, it's it, people see it as a, a kind of either or kind of situation, e either organic or synthetic. What's the difference between the two? You talk about fertilizers, for example. 
There's a big difference in the fertilizers because uh, organic fertilizers are nature's own slow release fertilizer. Um, I was thinking about it as if my four fingers were 25% each of a fertilizer. Mm -hmm. If the synthetic fertilizer is completely soluble, with the first big rain, it either washes down past the root zones or off and down the street and yeah, into, our, most uh, commonly, in, right? into our lakes, yes. Right. Whereas uh, with your organic fertilizers, there's only a small portion that is soluble at any one time, mm -hmm. and the rest are still locked up bef uh, while they're being slowly released by the microorganisms. Mm -hmm. So it, even if there were a, a strong rain, you're only losing what was soluble at the time, and the rest of your, your organic fertilizer right. is still there, uh, ready to uh, be released to the plants. That's a, gr a great, simple explanation for the difference between the two, you know. And, and just uh, leaving aside the toxicity sometimes that comes with synthetics, you know, the way that builds up into the environment. And I forgot to mention, too, that most of your synthetic fertilizers are NPK, mm -hmm. nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, whereas your organic fertilizers have a whole swath of trace elements and mm. minor ingredients that plants need to grow yeah. instead of just NPK. Yeah, it's, it, it's not as simple as NPK and people, no. you know, despite decades of the industry trying to beat that into our heads, it just doesn't quite work that way. Exactly. You know, uh, we're talking about fall coming up now and pretty quickly in terms of gardening. Um, and this is a great time for a gardening in Central Texas. I know the organic gardeners love gardening in the fall. Yes, uh, especially as the weather's cooling off, it's much easier to get out there mm -hmm. in the garden. But uh, there are planting calendars that mm -hmm. show that September is a basic month for um, planting a lot of your uh, fall greens and uh, other crops like broccoli and beets and, mm -hmm. and the like. When well, the Organic Gardening Club actually produces calendars people can access, and they can uh, log on to our website to learn more about that. But uh, you, you provide a lot of great resources to area gardeners. And that's a wonderful calendar because you can look at September and you can see which of those things can be planted in September, and right. so it's very helpful. Right. Well, you know, there are lots of different things that uh, people do love to plant in the fall. One thing people forget to plant in the fall <clears throat> often is strawberries. True, and uh, it is the time to plant it because here in Texas, with our heat, they just don't really make it as a, a perennial over the summertime without mm -hmm. uh, succumbing to diseases. So mm -hmm. they really are sort of an annual you plant in the fall with right. uh, getting them established so that they'll fruit in the spring. Right, you know, and a lot of people, I think it's in their minds that there's something you plant in the springtime, but you really want them to have their roots in the ground and get going for a period of time before that. Very much like uh, blue bonnets, which mm -hmm. establish themselves in the fall mm -hmm. rains and grow low and then pop up in the spring right. to produce, yes. Well, one thing we've all learned about in the past few decades, and I think it's kind of norm now, that people understand the value of raised beds, but there's big differences between different kinds of raised beds, especially in the vegetable garden. For example, planting in mounds as opposed to planting in furrows. What's your take on that? Well, my take on it is mm -hmm. the best beds uh, are, are the permanent beds that I like that mm -hmm. are limestone block put together and built up. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to replace them. If you use wood for the sides, you're going to have to replace the wood periodically. Yeah. And uh, some <clears throat> of our clay soils, you can actually just mound the, um, the raised bed up. With, and it supports itself, but if you have quite a bit of sandy component, that that falls away, and you need some kind of some kind of border to hold it up. The limestone too is just permanent. You do it once, and you've got it for life, right? Yes, you do. It's <laughs> it's the uh, expensive way, but you don't. You're not having to replace it periodically. Mm -hmm. yes. It's the expensive and heavy way. <laughs> indeed, indeed. But that's that's where you get some help from your friends and neighbors. Right? It, yes. But, it, well, it's really, it is really important to have those raised beds, as you say, and, the, and the, have those permanent raised beds. R real quickly, let's talk about succession planting. And, um, I think that's a, a, something that a lot of people, a lot of people think of just planting spring, plant and fall. But succession planting during those seasons can really make a huge difference in the crops. A, a real huge difference because um, you, lay, you lay your garden out and you may have a, a, 
a long row that you want to plant in beets, but you don't want to have all those beets uh, maturing at the same time. Right. So uh, with crops like that, you want to think plant half at a time and two or three weeks later plant the other half to, to uh, extend the season. All right. Well, extending the season is a great idea. Forest, uh, uh, your club has extended its season for 70 plus years now, so that's uh, good news for all of us here in Central Texas. People can learn more about you online and hook up uh, with the Austin Organic Gardeners and come to the meetings, get all yes. the information online. Thank you so much for being our guest today. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. All right, real pleasure. And coming up next is our friend Daphne.